In this series, we're in New York, meeting the risk takers and mold breakers who are changing the face of the fashion industry. This week, we're with two exceptional visionaries, both of whom have carved out unique yet vital business niches. Brooke Wall, the founder of The Wall Group, and the woman responsible for pioneering fashion law in the USA, Susan Scafidi. Make sure you subscribe to the British Vogue YouTube channel to catch it all. Just two decades ago, no one would have prophesied that stylists, makeup artists and hairdressers toiling away behind the scenes of fashion shows, red carpets and photo shoots would become celebrities in their own right. Hello! Hi. Apart from Brooke Wall, that is, who spotted early on that the industry's best stylists and technicians were underrepresented, despite their hugely powerful role curating the looks of the world's most revered celebrities and models. Give me a tour, please. Okay, great. What do these and these say? are, that says closers. Because that's the deal makers. Closers, they're closing the deal. Getting it done. After a few years learning on the job, Brooke set up her own agency, The Wall Group, in 1999, which has since evolved in perfect harmony with the ever changing landscapes of fashion and beauty. A fantastic role model for any aspiring businesswoman and an oracle for anyone wanting to pursue a career in the styling or beauty industries, it's rather amusing to learn that the whole thing started because she had a serious crush on a hairdresser. I mean, Brooke! I went to London and I studied hair just as an excuse to get to know him. Who is it? <laughs> I'm not telling you. Oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> so can you explain to us what The Wall Group is? The Wall Group is an agency that represents talent within the entertainment and fashion industry, such as hairstylists, makeup artists, wardrobe stylists, fashion stylists, set designers, manicurists. So everyone who's sort of behind the scenes. Magic um, elves that make something look beautiful. Yeah, the little sort of <laughs> fairies that run around behind the scenes and sort of sprinkle stuff all over people. Uh, we represent those individuals. So before you set this up, what was your experience of the fashion industry? Were you, were you hoping to be a stylist yourself or a makeup artist? Okay. I was always attracted to fashion. When I was in my teens in Canada, they would ask me if I would model. I did that once and I said, this isn't for me. <laughs> there are certain people that are in front of the camera people mm -hmm. and there are certain people that are behind the camera. And I felt very comfortable behind kind of orchestrating and being the puppeteer of making things happen. So right. I, I recognized that very early. And then when I came to New York, I thought, well, you know what would be fun if I just went and worked with, hey, that guy Orbe. He has like a little fun salon and he works with like Christy and Naomi and Linda and Kate and all those girls mm -hmm. in the 90s. And I'm just gonna go and I'll work with him and help him. So I went in, I had wet hair, I wore it under a hat, and Orve looked at me and said, anyone who has the balls to come for an interview with wet hair is hired. Wow. So he hired me on the spot. And um, just got to know everyone, and through that, Katie Ford approached me. She said, just start an agency. So I did. You were one of the first people to realize the star power that these talents behind the scenes had in their own right. So how did you first spot that maybe a stylist or a makeup artist could become their own brand almost. I noticed that celebrities were starting to become more and more prolific on the cover of magazines. And, you know, with the talent, I kind of felt like connecting them with that world could elevate them mm. equally. These people are celebrities within themselves. Yeah. They're equal to a lot of people that are out there in their field, like as an expert in their field. Can you talk to us about the ways in which your business has evolved to respond to the way that uh, the tech world has been incorporated into the fashion industry. Yeah, everybody has always said I'm a little crazy. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> and when Twitter first launched, I bought every Twitter book they had on social media and right. I ran around the office and I put it on all the agents' desks and I said, you have to read this cover to cover. You have to understand this. It is everything. It's the future of this industry. You have to, and they were all like, what is she talking about? How did you get that idea though? How did you know that that was because, gonna be such because a Because when thing? I started, the question on the phone about the artists was how many fashion shows have they done? Within probably four years of opening, the question started, what celebrities have they worked with? Right. Now it's how many followers do they have? Wow. 
So I've kind of always been aware that mm -hmm. the business is going to shift. Clearly a natural born innovator, Brooke has never been one to settle for the status quo. Dissatisfied by the monotony of promoting her talent's work on the news pages of her website, she ripped the blog down and replaced it with The Thick, an online magazine filled with juicy news and views from industry insiders. Can we talk about The Thick and yeah. what that is? And I can tell you exactly what it is. Tell us what it is. <laughs> the Thick is a very tongue-in-cheek, fun sort of insider in the thick of the industry, having all the information, as they say, telefax, telephone, telehairdresser, that's how you get a message around New York. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it really, they, there's a lot of information, but it's a celebration platform of everybody who is not celebrated in the industry, and then some who are. Mm -hmm. It's for our talent to display who they are to clients as well from a personal perspective, yeah. rather than just looking through portfolios, looking through Instagram, looking through traditional channels. It's in place for them to just tell a little story in two, three minutes. For me, at least, when I'm working with makeup artists or hairstylists, I'd say it's like 70% personality, 30% talent. Totally. Is what I'm looking for. Exactly. It's like, can I stand with you right. for a week? Right. In this industry as an artist, you are working with a group of people to create something and you have to be a person that people want to hang out with all day mm -hmm. and have fun with. And I think personality is so important, so important. I mean, I love a fanatical talent that can do something perfectly, but I also am realistic in knowing that you have to be human first. Yeah, I think that's good advice for people. Yeah. What about um, someone that was an a young entrepreneur and that was thinking of setting up their own business, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. are there some kind of guidelines you could give them or tidbits of advice that you wish you'd have known before starting your own company? <laughs> Maybe not do it. Uh, <laughs> no. You know, for me, I recognized pretty young something. There was a, I had an epiphany and I felt like by the time I was 23, you know what, I think I'm going to own my own business. I'm going to employ a lot of people. And I'm going to make all my own decisions by the time I'm 42. That's what's gonna happen for me. Never thought about it again. Continued struggling through my 20s, wondering, you know, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna, you know, 27 I woke up, I said, you know what, it doesn't really matter if I'm a janitor. As long as I do a great job at being a janitor, something will fall into place. The right thing's gonna to come to me. So Once, there I was, mopping floors. <laughs> there I was, and it struck me. <laughs> it just works that way. But you have to have a gut feeling if you're an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You have to know that you have that gene and you have to be tough as nails mm -hmm. and be able to withstand a lot of hits. I feel like not everybody is meant for that particular job yeah. you know, or responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. It's 24-7. It never shuts off. Um, and you are, you're, you're responsible for people's livelihoods. It's yeah. not just an accessory. It's not a handbag to have your uh, own a business. It's a huge responsibility. If you feel you want a leadership role, then I think you have to be very, very diligent. I think you have to be super smart. I think you have to study that role inside and out and understand everything about it. And you will get that. You will get that role. On we travel uptown and away from the shop fronts and into a neighborhood known for its higher education institutions to meet another incredible woman who spotted a gaping hole in the ultra sheer denier for the fashion industry stocking and admirably dove in headfirst to darn it up. Do you watch these things in the edit? Like this, for example, will someone have to watch, watch that? This, even me saying this, are they having to transcribe this as we speak? Oh. Ta da! <laughs> Hello! Welcome. Hi. Lovely to meet you. Here. Susan Scafidi, lover of frocks and professor of law, founded the Fashion Law Institute at the Fordham Law School in New York City, despite a distinctive lack of support from her male colleagues. Since then, she has advocated tirelessly for recognition of the need for a distinct fashion law, running the US's only and very oversubscribed fashion law course, and generally kicking conceptual butt in the murky field of copyright law. Which is the original and which is the knockoff? 
Very I, good, okay. I asked, okay. I asked this question um, over a period of a year and a half to everyone who wandered into my office, completely unscientific, but it was This is the original and this is the ripoff. Of course it is. Uh, you would know that, but <laughs> only about 75% of people got it right. Well, it was the finishing but that the, really gave it yeah, away. Yeah, the finishing, the quality fabric. of the fabric. Is there not a rule where it's like, if seven things are different, it's no, okay. No, that's the, that's the biggest urban legend okay. in fashion and so copyright law. So what is the law, copyright So law. In, in the US, this is legal. You don't have to change a stitch. Wow. Um, a long time ago, over 100 years ago, the US Copyright Office decided that fashion, even the most elaborate fanciful fashion, was merely functional and therefore couldn't be protected but if it's as produced, a work of art. If it's produced in the US under this law, but sold overseas where a different law is in place, do you then fall into the problem? It depends of... where it's first created and produced. Okay. So this, because it was first produced in Europe, is protected in okay. Europe. Okay. But if it had first been produced in the US and then it was copied in Europe, no such luck. Ten years ago, there was no such legal field as fashion law. Yeah. And I would tried for a long time at different institutions uh, to, to get permission to teach such a thing. And finally, Fordham decided to take a chance on it. And so we created a course here as part of the Fordham Law School curriculum. The idea was that it should be a resource for the industry. So five years after that, Dion von Furstenberg and the Council of Fashion Designers of America helped us create an institute, which is a separate nonprofit. Uh -huh. And we have a number of courses that we run inside of Fordham inside of the curriculum and we have a research program and we have public events and we have a clinic for designers who have no money and no clue and nowhere to go. How um, was it that it didn't exist 10 years ago? Was it not needed? Fashion houses, designers, models, etc. have always co uh, communicated with lawyers and consulted lawyers yeah. but there was no formal training for those lawyers and okay. so they had to sort of back into it and learn on their own. Yeah. Uh, and I think in part because this was the neglected industry. It is, as it is in Britain, the second largest industry in New York City mm -hmm. and yet there was no field of law to support it. And actually, my senior colleagues at another institution refused to let me work on it. They said, you can't write about fashion. It's too girly. It's too frivolous. No one will take you seriously. Oh. And I thought, it's a $1.8 trillion industry globally, approximately, give or take a trillion, right? They said, Also a trillion said no. between friends. <laughs> Precisely. And so I proposed fashion law. And my poor associate dean, had no idea what to say, just silent. One wonderful colleague said, well, we have sports law. We have two sections of sports law. Isn't fashion law just sports law for girls? I thought, well, it's support. I'll take it where I can get it. The associate dean said to me, you know, if, if Susan, if we don't get at least three students, I have to cancel the class. I said, okay. So seven o'clock in the morning, registration opened. 7.03, the course is full. 7.05, I get the first email. Professor, is, the, is the, the registration link broken? I can't get into your class. We had to double the size of the class, and that was 10 years ago and it went from there. Amazing. So you trained to be a lawyer. I did. Did you always have in mind that you would like to apply that skill set to the fashion industry Absolutely or did it sort not. of unfold? No, it most definitely unfolded. You know, I have my deep family roots in fashion, but never thought that fashion was something I could do professionally. Yeah. In fact, I studied legal history and was planning to be a legal historian. I studied me medieval ecclesiastical law of all things. I can't even like say that, let alone spell it. I'm not sure I can anymore either. Uh, but what, what happened was I was teaching intellectual property. Okay. And things like the video you're filming have extensive intellectual property protection, very harmonized all over the world. For your life plus 70 years, no one can copy this without your permission. Really? Or, or, <laughs> there you go. And le unless the copyright belongs to, to Vogue, which is a, a slightly I different story. I think that was in the contract but... at some point. I was <laughs> I... fighting for owning this concept. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and as well you should. Uh, but the protection of fashion is remarkably unharmonized. So we can go to country, from country to country and film and literature and works of quote unquote fine art are protected. But fashion is, is not, or at least not in many places and certainly not in the US. On the, sitting on the, on the desk is a law that we helped pass, actually. A framed thing with the blue ribbons oh, yeah. is a, a law to protect child models. Uh, in New York. Oh, really? Because all kinds of child performers had, had protections. So child actors and dancers and musicians had lots of protections with regard to the hours they worked and, and chaperones and percentage of, of what they were paid until they were of age and that sort of thing. And models specifically had no protection. Wow. And so we helped create an organization called the Model Alliance to... Yes, um, there is it. Amazing. Yeah. I was on my own and I didn't know how to stand up for myself. Unfortunately, because even the youngest models routinely work unchaperoned, 
Abuse of this kind is common. That is one of the jobs where you're rinsed the most in terms of being like a child that's working, but also giving your agent 20% and, and the client. And the client, yeah. they're going to pay another 20% on top of so, that. So they take 40% from there's, you. Exactly. There's a lot, well, you know better than anyone. There's Sucks. a lot of exploitation in that industry. Sucks. Yeah, it's amazing. Do you have any helpful hints to say you were a designer and you're setting up your own label? Are there a few key legal notes you could give someone that oh. would help them avoid a world of trouble? I'm, I'm so glad you asked. Well, uh, in speaking with young designers or design students, the first thing I say is please don't put your name on the label, or at least think twice. When you put your name on the label and you trademark that name, it becomes a corporate asset. Mm. And so if at some point you take on an investor, and then somewhere down the line, part company with that investor, your name goes with your investor and you have to walk nameless into the night. Yeah. And that's kind of That painful. happens a lot. It does happen a lot. For for people that are watching this um, who are like, oh, fashion law seems amazing, I'd love to get into that, but don't necessarily have the access to a local uh, degree in that area, what else could they do to potentially end up working in this arena? So at this point, we are the only degree program in the world. So move to New York. Courses, isn't that? So move to New York is one option. but. As a, short, as a short version of that, we run a two-week boot, boot camp, and we do it every year, and people come from literally all over the world. And it's, it's lawyers and law students and fashion professionals, which is really cool. Yeah. But if you can't make it to class, you can always read, and you should. Um, and, and continue to educate yourself. And if you actually want to practice in the area, uh, then you need to, to learn everything you possibly can about the business of fashion and then about the law and work to put them together. It seems wild that as little as 10 years ago, someone might consider it girly and frivolous to like uh, take yeah. fashion law seriously? I, for a while, I thought it had a question mark at the end of it because no one ever said fashion law. They said fashion law. <laughs> <laughs> and it was always like that. Next week for the final installment of our Fashion Tetralogy, it means four-part thingy, we're finally making all of your dreams come true. Welcome to my show featuring Alexa Chung. That's right, we're talking all things blogosphere with Leandra Medine of Man Repeller fame. I've been in England, I've been in France, and now I'm in America, bringing you all the latest on the future of fashion for British Vogue. So subscribe to the British Vogue YouTube channel and you can check out more of these beautiful documentaries. Starring me, Alexa Chung, Alexis Chan, Electra Tung. <laughs> <laughs>